I believe that there's, it's not us that's suicidal. Our stories are trying to die. Our ways that we were, were trying to die. And a belief system, a, a, you know, a relationship, a, a identity is trying to die. And if you start to get your just this moment and what you used to be is trying to die, this is going to be amazing. I have a couple more questions about these developmental years as a comedian. Sure. Obviously, you, you've had a lot of experience. You put in your 10,000 hours of that comedy, the college tour. But I'm curious, looking back now, what made you so successful compared to what everybody else was doing and compared to what you thought made you successful back in the early days? What made me so as, as And this is in the stand-up world? You said you killed a lot, yeah. And in the early days, you were killing, which is which is comedy uh, jargon for you. You were very they, effective. They went very, People very well, yeah. yeah. And that that's, by the way, weird <laughs> that it's called killing because bombing, which also means a type of killing. <laughs> right. Um, it means, means you did, did horribly. Badly. Yeah. So if you bomb, you did bad. But if you killed, you did great. Um, so you have to have a very specific type of murdering if you want to do well. Um, a cup, I, I think one thing that honestly helped me a lot was having booked a couple of big teen movies and being college age. I would perform at these conventions of, called NACA where different colleges would get together and they would book the entertainment for the year. And I would have a set that was kind of edgy and talked about things that they grew up with, like blowing into the original Nintendo, the Pillsbury Doughboy, Sunny Delight. Like I had all these bits that were very topical for our age combined with that I had been in those teen movies. And I got to do so many and so I, in my 20s, performed nightly, either headlining a comedy club or doing what started off as hour-long sets but kept going to longer. And I, you know, it was like boot camp for me because I would go on a tour. I remember one time doing, I don't know if this number is right, this might be wrong, but doing, I think, 168 colleges in a row. And literally no day off. So you're doing two, three flights a day. You're exhausted, but you get to the gig and just rip it and you would have the set and and I would watch I went up so many times that the act started writing itself when I was on stage in other words I'd have these little kind of tangents on a bit that would go off and longer sometimes I'd pretend like I made a mistake like in other words and then go off and then do a tangent bit on that and I, I just noticed as long as I kept going up I did another set and I would get paid for it and prove to my mom that I was legitimate with a check that the colleges were giving me and they were crazy pay. And that was the constant drive that I overlooked my health. I overlooked sleeping. I overlooked everything, but boy, did I go up a lot. And then when I went back to LA, those are like showcase clubs. So I'd be doing 10 minute sets, which was almost harder for me than doing an hour and a half. But like I had so much material just developing its set itself. And then you just kind of start trying a potential thing and it would write. So what made it go well was doing it every day. I mean, it's it's that basic. And and I wasn't practicing every day. I was doing it every day. And they're they're mm. different. You know, practicing is this kind of energy that later is better. This mm -hmm. was I'm in my completeness every second I'm doing it. And it's getting better as I'm doing it, right? Like, mm. so I'm doing it again and I'm doing it again. But that kind of energy of uh, over there is the goal. Like this isn't doing any, it's just doing it for that was would be very minimal compared to the energy of me in this, right? So you've written, you've written about how you got to a point where you just got bored, you stopped creating the material and... Oh, you I don't know which came which came before, but you started having panic attacks as well. So, can you talk a little bit about yes. that period of time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, so your that mindset. was the, that was the opening to my first shift, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, like this is this is the first moment of me understanding there's a matrix, there's more than this, there's there's a, a changing of thinking available. This is the kind of the beginning of the revelation. I'm a comedian before I'm a person, and that. I was also, because of all those colleges, I was able to do my act also pretty much in my sleep. In other words, if I wasn't writing more, and I, there were times where I could go up on stage, 
do an hour and a half and maybe I'd throw something in every once in a while, but it wasn't a challenge at all. And on the internal, there was boredom and on the external I'm killing. And I, and I really believe if you don't keep creating, this is kind of a thing that I've said, this is a, especially for that consciousness. It's kind of, I have new thoughts now on this whole thing, but if I don't keep creating, my mind will creatively sabotage me. And mm. sometimes even though it looks good on the external, you might be living nowhere near what the truest you is or your potential. And just because I was able to go on stage and kill doesn't mean I wasn't that I was being challenged anymore. I could go on stage, rip the place apart and be bored inside. So one day my mind really creatively came up with this bizarre thought. I'll never forget. I'm on stage in Mesquite, Nevada. I'm, and I have this thought, I wonder if you could think about it enough, if you could make yourself faint. And then mm. right when I thought that I got dizzy and I, I felt myself whiting out for a second. And I was like, I just remember everything going white and me just being like, what the f and I had this fear and I was on the external. I'm just killing. I'm doing a show and blah, 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 blah. Just having a great set. And inside I'm, my mind is going, what the hell was that? Like, I'm, I don't know what I'm even saying on the external. I'm much <laughs> more listening to the inside while some habit is doing its thing. And I walk off stage and I said to a couple other comics, like I have this bizarre thing that I could make myself faint when I'm on stage. And they're like, oh yeah, you totally could. You know, they, you could keep thinking about it. And the underlying belief that I hadn't gotten to for years later is if I faint while I'm on stage, then my career's over and then I'm, I'm no person. I'm not, I don't exist if I don't have comedy. Like there's, I'm not loved if I don't have comedy. I'm not, no one will see me. And no one, I don't need to be here. And so the, the ego was like, we got to keep, we got to keep this fit. We got to fix this. So I remember the next day, me starting to obsess over it and being worried that when I got on stage that night, that I'd make myself faint. And I would think about it all day. And I'd picture, I started picturing it. I started seeing me collapsing. And this, this started escalating so much more. And this also happened, I think, because I didn't sleep years before. I was touring so much and eating drive through drinking at night, and then drinking coffee in the morning with two hours of sleep, an hour, whatever, nothing, just getting to the next gig. And so my body was just full of crap. It was just full of drive through and nothing and whatever, and no exercise, nothing. And so this ended up becoming an anxiety that became the only thing I thought of, became only what I was obsessed with. The every second was just, and all I would see when I'd see people all of a sudden on TV or something is them fainting or them falling apart. And basically the belief was you can't not think about something, right? So the belief in my mind was, I'm not going to be able to not think about this. Mm -hmm. And so that's the whole thing. And while I was at the height of it, when it was at the very worst levels, I booked my first Comedy Central appearance with three months notice. And my manager goes, it's a show called Premium Blend. And my manager goes, uh, well, don't blow it. And the first thing I thought was, how would I blow it? What if I faint on that? And this became this obsession that every second for three months, I was just, it, it was in my body to a point where I, I, it got to even worse than just on stage. It was everywhere. And I got to a point where I couldn't walk anymore. I got scared of the biggest anxiety came once when I was on a gym floor with a junior high school doing an assembly. And this created this reverse claustrophobia where I got really big anxiety when I was on a big, hard floor that was wide open. I wanted small things that I could hold on to the side. And um, <clears throat> that created this anxiety. So for three months, I just pictured myself fainting on it and got really worried about it and worried about how it would ruin my career. And this is my big shot with Company Central and I'm going to blow it. And I just got all this practice and I'm the, I'm so good as a comedian and now I'm not going to be able to, it's my one shot. And so I, I did premium blend and I did it way faster than usual because every second was just me holding the mic stand like this. My feet turned into me thinking, don't faint, don't faint, don't faint, don't faint. And I walk off stage and I'm so happy it's done. And it's seconds later, they're like, you got a Comedy Central half hour. But that was so good. You got a half hour special. And I'm like, it wasn't good. And I and I now I'm going to worry about feigning on that. 
the girl I was dating got worried about that. Now I'm going to hear you worry about that. And she had a point. But after that, there was a moment that was really big where I was obsessing over it again. And I was like, I'm going to go get, I'm going to go get anxiety medication. And I, I remember being at the beach before that and really picturing going to a gun shop actually, and just ending this because I was so miserable that the, all the opportunities I've wanted are finally showing up when I'm not ready for them all of a sudden. And, um, uh, yeah, I was like, I'll, I'll go to, I guess I won't kill myself. I'll go to the hospital. And I signed in and the waiting took too long. The, 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 I, I sat in the waiting room for 45 minutes and I heard a voice go get up. This was a big moment in my life because I, I wonder if I was, they were on time, if I would be alive because I might've been addicted to pills and not actually ascended myself and learned what this was. But I felt a voice go get up. And I just was like, okay. And, and I was like, I, but I, I had all the yeah, buts, like they'll be mad at me like, <laughs> if you go like everything, but I just got up and I walked out and I, I, I remember calling my mom, like, I'm, I'm going to face this thing. I heard a voice. And my, my mom was just like, why do you have some weird anxiety thing? Like it was just this, Never mind. Okay. I'll figure this out myself. And I went to a borders bookstore and I typed in anxiety into the search and all these aside from fixing anxiety books, the whole self-help section was where they were located. And so mm. I, I found Tony Robbins and I'm like, I've heard of that guy. And I, I got a Tony Robbins book. I got Awaken the Giant Within. And this new level of hope started showing up. Uh, there was a thing he said, it's true. You, he said, it's true. You can't not think about something, which addressed the thing I was worried about. But he goes, you also can't think of two things at the same time. So I thought, I never, what if I replace something that's exciting and challenging, but is beyond, you know, what I'm used to. So instead of me being like, don't faint on the Comedy Central half hour special, I thought, how can I have the number one Comedy Central special? And I started spending every day with full anxiety, waking up, jumping out of the bed and saying out loud, you have the number one Comedy Central special. I'm like running around the house. Like you're the best comedian ever. You're blah, blah, blah. I'm saying this to myself. And I remember the first day getting 10 minutes in and feeling the anxiety, not having as much of a hold and me being like, holy shit, that was just 10 minutes in. Like, what if I keep going? So I got excited about like, that was like the first day at the gym. What if I did a hundred days? And the, the special was going to be recorded like 90 days down the road or whatever. So every day I did this hour picturing it was number one thing. It's funny because where I live now is at such a different consciousness than this story, but it's really the beginning of just the, the changing your thinking level. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I got to the special and I was excited about it and free of the anxiety, probably 90% free of it. and. Mm -hmm. And it was the most, it was the number one special. It was the most played special in 2006 and it got a major standing ovation and it was great. And this was the beginning of this Tony Robbins make it happen achievement phase that is a great stage in my life that was totally needed. And so it's funny because Michael Beckwith has a book called Life Visioning and he talks in the, the book about four stages of awakening. And this was the beginning of from one to two. And for me, he talks about the first level is called to me, where you're in this victim mentality of everything is happening to me. It's because of my, my mother, it's because of the economy or my ex. That's why my circumstances are this. And the way I also phrase it is eventually to me runs you into the ground, you become addicted, you become suicidal, or you go into a second stage where you learn how to change your circumstances, which is that second make it happen, motivation by me stage, right? And it says you you get from the first, and it says in Michael Beckwith's book, you get from the first stage to the second stage by releasing, you get to each stage by releasing something. First to second happens when you release blame. Now you'll still have times where you have blame, but it's not the main running only thing. You know, you start to get, there's a you, there's, you can change the circumstance or whatever. So the second of the four stages is by me. And that's the achieving world. That's the people that have a million Lamborghinis and you know are building the businesses and number one. And 
my opinion is eventually that also can run its course because you're still under the illusion that you are these things you're achieving. And even though you're not run by your circumstances anymore, you're still a victim to if they fall apart. So you're still very control-based, right? And so I went through a few years of, through massive effort and force and making it happen, having really good Comedy Central stuff, having a good comedy career, and Tony Robbinsing my way through everything, making it happen, achieving, and it was great, right? So that's kind of how I got to the second stage. I want to just go back and talk, talk about one thing. You said that voice that told you to get up and leave, right? That voice plays a prominent role in your life later on. And I'm, I'm curious, was that one of the first times that you followed it? Or was I think that something that, you were used to doing at the I time? Think that, yeah, I think that there's a level of volume based on what you're following. In other words, mm -hmm. if you're if you're following a lot, the more you follow, you're screwed, life isn't that easy, then that voice is really loud. Mm -hmm. But I was, I, I, by the way, this is not, I, I sure don't recommend this method to anybody, but I notice I always hear that new voice right after my edge of suicide <laughs> because it's actually the literal death of an old story happening. And, and I believe that there's, it's not us that's suicidal. Our stories are trying to die. Our ways that we were were trying to die. And a belief system, a, a, you know, a relationship, a, a identity is trying to die. And if you start to get your just this moment and what you used to be is trying to die, this is going to be amazing, right? But if you think that's you, you're trying to stop that voice that is needing to die from dying. It'd be like thinking you're the skin cells that are dying all day and trying to trap them on and negotiate this. It's like, let, let, let what's not you fall off. But, you know, I had that moment at the hospital where I'm in the waiting room right after I was at the beach, figuring out if I should go buy a gun and feeling the motions of really considering suicide. And um, finally just feeling through that and crying a little bit and being like, what do I do? And then after a little bit of surrender and like, I'm lost, I don't know what to do. There's kind of an opening for asking God for help. There's kind of an opening for, I don't know. I'm like, there's not the, the old story of Kyle can't fix this mm -hmm. a higher level of Kyle that I've never seen before can. And I think that because I really felt through I, I give up. Mm -hmm. I suddenly heard a new voice because I wasn't fighting from the old voice anymore. And this voice was quiet, but I remember hearing it and following it and it got louder. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, because I said yes to it, it could have been a passing voice, but I just, I just was like, I don't want to get, I all don't know what to do. I don't want to have an anxiety forever but I don't want to just numb it and just have a bunch of pills too. I don't only want that. And I sure don't have any problem with what everyone else chooses. But for me, there was something about that that was like a kind of a numbing giving up versus a good giving up. Sometimes giving up's good if you, if you replace it with the universe, if you replace it with God, if you mm -hmm. really let everything fall off that needs to, your giving up can be a real gift. Because then you can hear higher voices and you can hear next steps and you can hear permission and you can hear synchronicity and miracles and all of that's here. Mm -hmm. And it's, it starts to be normal when you follow it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so that voice was really a big voice in my life. And cause I do think if I had ignored it, I really, I don't know if I would have stayed a comic, if I'd just be on pills my whole life, if I would have never transcended it, maybe I would have still had the same awakenings later. I don't know. I don't know what would have happened, but that was- I imagine thing. that voice was the thing that guided you to the Tony Robbins material. Totally. And, and so once you started absorbing that, as a student of life, like most comedians are, did you start working that into your comedy? Like when did the spiritual content start to- make an appearance in the in yeah. the bits that you were doing at that time. Did. There was a subtle desire and on both ways for the comedy to have a little bit of positive permission, but also I was just becoming 
also a coach and motivated and like, like, so the, so there were a couple things. There were bits that I did. I did a bit where I said, it's so weird because you can make anything fun. Like I'm going to make my death fun. Like I say on stage, like, we're all going to die. Why not have fun with it? Why do we worry all the way until the death? And we're like, you guys, I'm going to die. And then we die. And we're like, see, I told you I'd die. And you're like, how are you talking to me? And I said, <laughs> in the last 10 seconds, when I have everyone gathered around in the hospital, I'm going to get my body into a very nice, tight, entangled yoga pretzel position, just like a really stiff knot, because I know that your body gets stiff when you die. And I want to make it very hard for my family to unscramble me. And, <laughs> and this whole bit form from that. And then there was a great bit about the news is just trying to make you depressed. And I said, uh, I, I God, I'm trying to remember. It's so weird. Cause it was a huge bit of mine, but now I'm trying to remember. I said it, I said, can you imagine how not scared of flying we would be if the news just told us about the 30,000 flights a day that made it? Yeah. With when the people same walk off. How was your, <laughs> yeah. With the same, landing with the same breaking news intensity, because that's also news. A plane took off and landed. That's way more news to me yeah. than the planes that didn't make it. So I think every time a plane lands, they should interrupt whatever they should mm -hmm. whatever show you're watching and interview every person as they're getting off the plane. You'd be like, Oh, I want to try flying. And then I say, Something like, and then they don't, they scare the crap out of you. And then they list all these pills that have all the side effects in the commercials for anxiety that they just gave you. And mm -hmm. I realized I'm kind of coaching them in through stand up, but not, mm -hmm. not point blank saying it. Like I'm not preaching, mm -hmm. but I'm, but it is an angle that was feeling really positive and good and calling bullshit on darkness and making death okay these are good spiritual principles but made comedic so in 2009 the act started getting there and mm -hmm. it had a combination of regular stand-up and observe observational stuff but that too and i really went through a phase that i am letting go of of when that i know i'm sure you know what i mean that when you have your first awakenings you want everyone to know about it mm -hmm. and you need everyone to know that they can have this thing. Mm -hmm. And because I went from suicidal anxiety to number one comedy central special through Tony Robbins and changing my thinking. And that same me that was oblivious to what everyone thinks would just get in everyone's face and be like, dude, you can have everything you want. You can have an amazing. And now I'm looking at me like I might as well have go knocked to their door and said, have you found Jesus or something? Because, right. <laughs> you know, like I'm just coaching everyone uninvited, thinking that what I'm offering them, they'll want, but really forgetting and not knowing until way later that a factor in my shift was my fall apart, my depression, my, my lostness, my need for it. And not every, you know, if I had coached the me in 2002, he, I, that me would have been like, get the hell away from me. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like the me that mm -hmm. was showing everybody is just thinking they got to know about Tony Robbins. And I'm going through this thing that I'm sorry, for, sorry, everybody for, I get it now. Like yet you don't have to force everyone else to do that, but it was a given to me. They wanted that, you know, and, and learning later, maybe not everyone does. So, um, I went vegan, raw vegan, you know, years and years and years ago. Um, during that period, I relentlessly decided to follow my heart. I made a decision to move from New York to LA. I changed my name to light. So all kinds of shit can happen when you go raw vegan. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, are you still, if you don't mind me no, asking? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not. But I'm yeah. curious, uh, I know that's a big part of your story, but, and it supposedly happened spontaneously, but well, what happened prior to that yeah no i would actually say this is how i went from stage two of michael beckwith's book mm -hmm. of of the second stage of by me to the third stage of through me which is okay. where you have to release control because it's you're actually you actually came in right because that's where i left off in my journey is the next thing mm -hmm. because i because I became this Tony Robbins in the comedy scene and wanting all, everyone to know they can have the life they want. Uh, I got very passionate about as a headlining comedian, showing aspiring comedians that they could have this life too. 
And so I started doing this thing where I was coaching as I like would do events where I wanted young comedians, open micers, whatever, to know they could have this. And I created this thing called Stand Up Boot Camp. And it was like this boot camp for aspiring comedians or people that just wanted to bring comedy into whatever their life was or whatever. So it was kind of combining, you know, my massive life experience as a comic with, you know, some of my my version of Tony Robbins principles. So there'd be this kind of motivational point, plus all the lessons I learned from the road. And some big comics came and spoke at it. And one was Louis Anderson, the, the, led, the late, great Louis Anderson. And he and I ended up partnering together. And we were teaching people this. And I went through this kind of six months, maybe or so, of us doing these events on the road. And the audience was either aspiring comics that liked it, or there were other comics that knew about it, thought it was cool. Or there was also a wave of people that weren't going who comics are about calling BS on everything. And, and I would hear through the grapevine comics that were peers of mine were talking crap about me. Like Kyle went off the deep end. Is he a Scientologist now? Is he a cult leader? What's going on? And I remember one very big day. This is the big, big week of the next level of my shift. I met breakfast with Louie and I'm telling him, I really want to get over what people think about me. And I, I go back to my hotel. There's a car that's supposed to take me to the airport. And I get this email and it's like, Hey, you con man. It said, I read this blog, this comedian wrote about you. And I clicked the link. This is like 2010 and a, 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 a comic that didn't know me and wasn't there made wrote a blog spelling out how I must be doing this for the money, which I really wasn't making. It's so, so funny as a comic, I, which I stopped doing to do this for a while. I was making five to 10,000 a show. And this, I was, we're developing it. It was like a hundred to $200 for the weekend, you know, and this, this blog was written, you know, and spelling out that, I'm this guy doing this for the money. You can't teach comedy. Anyone that says you can is, I also had a belief that I get some of their points. And sometimes I still believe what I believe, which is I believe everyone can be funny. And this is the thing that really pissed comics off. Like, cause like anyone can be a comedian. And I, I, an example I give is if you've ever said anything headliner level funny, like you're just at, at a, dinner with someone you're riffing about an ex or politics or something and it comes through funny that you have that in you right like that's there maybe you didn't channel it or use it or harness it but that was a huge argument against me that kyle just thinks anyone can be funny and you know i've now seen some comics that have worked 10 years that are not funny and have continued to be not funny so i'm like i get their point too but they're working comics <laughs> So I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trying to shit on them. I'm just open to maybe not everyone is supposed to be a comedian also. So I get that point. And I think there are some people that have insane comedy potential that think they're not funny, that aren't tapping into it, that could. So there's, there's arguments to both, but so I, I read this blog, this guy wrote and it gets shared among the comics, like tons of them share it. And all of a sudden it's this viral point that I am scamming people as like a cult leader for money. And I was too young to handle that the way I, like something in me needs to die to handle this. <laughs> Cause it was so overwhelming and I got so much hate and I felt so horrified, but I had enough Tony Robbins in my body to know I'm about to learn a new thing. So I told the car that was going to take me to the airport to go without me. And I canceled the next week's tour and I stayed in the hotel for six days. And I just watched as I had no idea what to do. And for the first four days, my body kept coming up with all these solutions like karate kid. I'll show them with another number one special. I'll prove it circumstantially. Right. And I, and I would feel these triggers and these fears and, and see myself on the other side of them. And on day four, I had this moment <clears throat> where I watched as 
I noticed, wait, it's been four days of me safe in a hotel, saving my life, but I'm safe. Like I've been in fight or flight based on my thoughts of the future versus the circumstance. And this moment happened where my thoughts were over here and they're just, oh, I'll do this, do this, do this. And, and I'm looking at them and I just feel this moment where like, I'm, I'm not my thoughts. Like these thoughts that are going crazy aren't me. They're saving their life. And there was some separation where all of a sudden I wasn't my problems. I wasn't my accomplishments. I wasn't my history. And everything just collapsed. And I was just a dude staring at the wall and time changed. There wasn't time. Like it, five hours passed. So I'm just staring at the wall and it felt like very quick. And I just, I don't know. Everything was suddenly different. Like this whole shell of all my fears and everything just collapsed. And this was suddenly, you know, I'm, I'm not against motivation. I love it. But this was the end of the motivational phase of my, my life. And the reason is because when I got back, I had these things I was actually hearing myself say at the, the boot camps and teaching and stuff. And I heard this calling in me that goes, and this, by the way, isn't a pitch for raw veganism as much as it's the story of the, the lifting of the thing. But I heard this calling in my body go, what if you went raw vegan for 90 days? And so I decided to leverage myself to for sure do it. And I announced to the public, I'm going to go 90 days eating raw vegan. If I eat anything cooked or animal product, I'll give away 10 grand. So this like put me on the island and burn the boat. It's like if someone walks by with a cookie and offers it to me. I, it's a $10,000 cookie. I'm not eating it. So for 30 days, I remember getting really healthy and doing this with my friend, Diego. He was doing it with me. He was also does good filming of stuff and everything. And we get to day 30. I remember this moment where someone walked by me with a hot dog and I smelled it. And all I smelled was chemicals and metal. Like it didn't. And I noticed that my taste buds just changed. Like, that blew my mind that like 30 days ago, a hot dog would have been an amazing craving. And now it felt like it fell off of me and just feels ridiculous. So I started going, what else feels heavy and getting excited about letting go of other things. So I was like, what if I got off Facebook? What if I didn't date for a while? What if I, whatever. And this began this principle that was really big. And this moment I said to Diego, he said this quote, I said, I wonder if I, let go. What if I canceled Facebook? I didn't cancel it, but I said to him, what if I did? And he said, the only thing I know is in the car with me. He goes, the only thing I know is if you do, you will be able, you will only be able to, your stress comes from, you'll only be able to measure what you'll lose. You can't see what you'll gain. This became the essence of how I lived. If it's heavy, let go of it. If it's heavy, you're keeping it because you don't trust and there's a higher thing. So we get to like day 45 and I was going to go do a stand I was going to do do stand up at a comedy club and I remember thinking I don't I don't want to do com I was just literally going ugh and I had this moment where I'm like oh shit I went up so I went up in vibration and now my dream career comedy is heavy. Right? So this was a big moment because I was like I have to honor the thing. If, you, if it's heavy, you can only measure what you lose. You can't see what you'll gain. So I tell the clubs I'm not coming. We're not going to go do stand-up. The next week was a big week because I'm now someone who's not doing my old dream career. And I can hear what's here. I'm, and in fact, I would even say, and this is something that should be exciting for people, I realized I'm even bigger than my dream career because I'm letting go of it, right? Like I'm not these external have-tos anymore. I'm I'm bigger than it. And so we get to day, whatever, uh, 40, 45, I let go of it. It's a week later and I hear my body go, what if you combine comedy and transformation? And I, I, I hear my ego go, well, no one's ever done that. Like at least the way I want to do it. I know there's comedians that make points, but like, it was like, no one's ever done that. And my soul was like, no one's ever done that. It's your own field. It'd be like your own thing. So I said to Diego, like, what if we film videos for the colleges by name 
right? And and I literally make a video and we've shot hundreds of videos where I'm like, hey, this is a video for Diane Johnson at North Idaho University. And this is Kyle Cease. And many of those people had had me as a comedian there. So I said, I'd love to do the lecture circuit at your school. So I remember comics that we give me shit, like, why aren't you going to do a club? And then a ton of those colleges said yes at a way higher price, like around 10 grand a pop. And instead of me doing a week at a comedy club, doing morning radio at a club next to an Applebee's for three to five grand, I'm now flying out, hitting one college, saying exactly what I believe, flying home for 10 and getting a ton of those all of a sudden being the best choice for lecture circuits as it's uh, the guy from 10 things I hate about you and these movies they know, and I'm their age more and everything and just getting all this work for so much more money. And I had a huge agency, I had a really big agency and they wanted 10% of these gigs, but they also wanted me to stay a comic. They didn't like this weird transformational person I was becoming. So even though they were a huge agency, they were becoming heavy, right? Like they, 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 they were out of alignment, even though they handled household name people. They want me to stay a comic and they want 10% of this stuff. They have nothing to do with it. I'm getting more gigs on my own anyway. So they're out of alignment. They feel heavy. So this was a scary let go. And I have a, I, I was justifying keeping them because they get me auditions for movies and stuff. And I have a big rule that if you're justifying keeping something, you have to let go of it. This is really big because I wouldn't it be weird if you're on a date with someone and they go, I guess I like you because I like your clothes. Like, you, you know, they don't like you, right? Wouldn't I be a crappy dad if I was like, I guess I'll keep being Vivi's dad because she gets good medical coverage. Like, mm -hmm. like, and I don't justify what I do for a living, but we do have things in our life we do justify. Like, I hate this job, but I know I'm getting a promotion later. I don't like this person. I don't feel safe with them, but they took me to a nice dinner that one time. When we justify something, this is what that is. That's your ego explaining to yourself and making sense out of why you're ignoring your heart. And if you keep that thing, you ignore your heart more and more until you just bury it. So people that are in jobs they hate for 30 years, they don't even know there is a calling or a heart. They've just ignored it so much. You know, I don't say that with judgment. I understand why too. But when you're justifying something, it's you, you have to be explaining why you're not doing what your soul wants you to do. And so until it buries you. What's that? You, you can bury it or it'll bury you, but something's right. getting buried. Something's getting, and and I, I want to reiterate, I don't mean this with, ju uh, with judgment because we all just come from different consciousnesses. In fact, this makes sense. But you notice how there's a lot of people that were born in the 20s that have those like 70 year relationships. But if you ask them anything emotional, they don't want to say anything. They don't talk emotions. They don't talk about what it was like in the war or whatever. And you start to also hear in a lot of those relationships, really dark crap that happened. Like, oh, my grandpa was this raging alcoholic and we were all abused. And you, it was just normal. Why is that? Because you weren't listening to your souls unfolding. In fact, back in the 30s and 40s, no one even knew that was a thing, I think. But this just this like you're in this long thing and you just end up being identified as the relationship that you're in for 30, 40, 50 years or the job you were in and you lost your calling, your soul. And I don't say that so anyone feels guilt. In fact, I'm hoping it's just permission for people right now that feel in certain circumstances that they're buried in that they can let go of them. And but isn't that weird when you hear you ask grandpa about what he felt you know, if they're in a thing for 50 years, they, they don't talk about themselves. There's no, they just kind of become shells, you know? So you do bury you when you, when you ignore that calling. And so I let go of this agency. And then right after that, I get this call that this event called gate is happening. Global Alliance of Transformational Entertainers. It turns out Jim Carrey and Eckhart Tolle had paired up and created an event and they saw me and wanted me to speak at it. That is the most Kyle combo. And by the way, they're the most opposing energies on the planet. 
Like you might as well say on a scale from Eckhart Tolle to Jim Carrey, how excited are you to see me? Because there's, their energies are so opposite and that'd be the least likely pairing at the time. And it felt like this mirror of me letting go of all the have tos from my perspective. It's just like right after I let go of this huge agency and prove to the universe, I trust it. This bizarre Kyle combo has formed an event and wants me to speak at it. And I did it and I, I went, I performed and I, when I went to that stage, there wasn't a me that was Kyle, the unworthy guy who's so lucky to be here with these people, or they're they're higher than me or anything. I'm the guy who has let go of, of eating crappy food. I'm the dude who has let go of the top agency. I'm a guy who's let go of my career and found an even higher connection to source. And I just so was the moment. And I went on stage with nothing prepared, I see Jim Carrey, Eckhart Tolle, fourth row. And I go, this is so weird. I'm told that I'm what would happen if Jim Carrey and Eckhart Tolle had a baby. I said, I don't know if you guys are picturing that. Eckhart, I know you're not because it's a thought and you don't have those. And then I said, some of you guys might think that joke's offensive, but it's in the past. So Eckhart doesn't even know about it. And like <laughs> spiritual comedy just was suddenly born and the whole place was screaming and awesome and loved it. And I did like this eight minute set Doing completely improvised com completely off the cuff i it was all yeah 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 i mean for me that's easier like because you know when you go to dinner you don't have a set list right you don't it'd be weird if you did if you're just sitting there like do you have any pets do you have do you like ice cream like and so like for me that was easier i mean all my stand-up experience my transformations were all coming into the set and i was just was in the moment and this this thing came through and it was cool because it was headliner level comedy delivering things that the spiritual community would get. And that was so fun, you know, cause it was, it wasn't like when a spiritual speaker goes, I thought I'd start off with a little joke I heard on the way here, <laughs> you know, that it was like real comedy coming through. And so then after that, all these people in the audience were like producers from different things and, you know, offering me little appearances and things or shows or their seminars or their events. And I was suddenly getting all this work all over the place after I let go of standup. And so it was so ironic because I let go of standup. I had no idea what I would gain. And all of these doors opened on the other side. And I'm just thinking of if I had been not performing as the spirit, like the video that the Jim Carrey Eckhart Tolle people saw was me on the college tour delivering the spiritual com comedy. So because I followed that, I made a demo of it and then they saw that and invited me. So I got, I mean, that was the awakening of this whole new world. And so what stemmed out of that is evolving out loud, which I've now done for 12 years, I guess. Cause it was 2000, maybe, maybe yeah. 2011 to 23, probably. So 12, 11 and a half, something like that, which is these huge events that are in big theaters and stuff. And they're, you know, this, this thing that I know as I do this work is that everything everyone feels that's a limitation is an illusion. And so when someone's feeling pain about something, the usual cause is it's triggering something from under it that's not seen. And I spent the last 12 years helping people see that and releasing whatever the trauma is that's in there and seeing the illusion they're in. Cause I'm kind of speaking from the other side of that shift from two to three, right? Does that make sense? The shift from two to three, if you want to go back to the Beckwith book, is from that achiever state in two, letting go of control, because that's what I let go of when that guy wrote the blog. And by letting go of control, that put me into three. And in letting go of control, so many miracles started happening around me. It got so synchronistic and weird. I'd go anywhere. I'd know what song is coming on, or I'd think of someone, I'm like, they're going to be at the store. And it started becoming this kind of course in miracles life and life still challenges you and it's taking you even further, but you go from the second stage, you release control and you go to the third stage, which Michael Beckwith calls through me. And that's where you're more about high and low vibrations. I kind of see Esther Hicks as and Abraham Hicks as teaching three, follow vibration, go to the vortex, that kind of thing. 
And I think four is oneness. I think four is, is moving to the as me state, which is where you remove the illusion of separation. And I get that right now I'm being interviewed by myself, like myself in the illusion of the story of light Watkins <laughs> is, is light Watkins is interviewing himself right now. Anyone watching this is hearing themselves talk, be interviewed by themselves. We're all one. And the only thing that creates the separation is the mind. And the more I do this work, I notice the mind can dissolve because most of our eye is just a collection of traumas. So you, you got this kind of eye you created that's sitting on top of a trauma, right? Does that make sense? So like, if you were, if you didn't get straight A's one day and you got beaten for it, you might create some major achiever that doesn't want to get beaten, but then you do that enough that you call that you, but what you are is this character that's just avoiding getting hit. And then you bring that to when you're an adult and your dad's not there, but you're still doing it. I'm able to see that in people, right? Because I am seeing that in me all the time. So I bring people on calls and shift them and can identify the illusion that they're in. You mentioned sure. that you guys do Evolving Out Loud in huge theaters, but it wasn't always like that. And I think the conventional wisdom is when demand gets to be enough, then we'll be able to grow into a larger, a slightly larger arena than what I'm doing now. But you kind of took the opposite approach. So can you just share that? Right, right, right. One time, this is a really interesting thing. I had a manager for a long time that really was amazing at challenging me to be more than I could see, which was amazing because I could see big, but this guy could sit outside of me and reflect even bigger and took me to places that were scary, but true. And I believe that's a great purpose in relationships. Like people are, if you're going to be in a relationship, whether it's romantic or friendship, having people that can shine on you a level that's past what you can see is really big because that creates the space for permission that's bigger. So I, when I started doing Evolving Out Loud, the first way I did it was by doing like a hotel ballroom that would be maybe 200 seats, 150 to 200 seats. And I would invite other speakers to come speak on the stage. So I, and I had big different speakers. I had Marianne Williamson once I had, uh, I've had Beckwith before I had Bob Proctor and I do these kind of 200 seaters and they were great. And I would do these two, three day events and one day my manager, Norm, goes, yeah, they were great. That was good. I'm going to dare you to do one by yourself. And my fear was like, how do I sell that? It was so easy to sell. Hey, come, you'll see Marianne Williamson talk. It's weird to be like, so it's me. And he goes, I'm going to challenge you to do it. And I remember one day, one of my friends saying, if you did do it, how big of a theater would you want to do? And I just went into fantasy world and I said, like a, like a, like a thousand to 2000 seater. So we went with say yes and figure out how and make a leap energy. So the first theater we rented was the Alex theater in Glendale, which is 1400 seats. So I rented it blind. I rented it having no idea how I would fill it. But once I rented it, I went from being the person who wants to do that theater energetically to the person who does that theater. And something in my paradigm shifted where it went from being a goal or a dream to normal. And your awareness changes when that happens. Like you're just open to everything's away. And a week later, I went to go get I went to go get dental work done and I'm in the waiting room at this kind of holistic dentist. And she, she introduces me to the lady that's sitting next to her on the couch. She goes, this is Christine Blogsdale. She works at KPFK. Kyle is a speaker and transformational, whatever, whatever the hell I do. And Christine said, uh, Oh, do you have any events coming up? Because we do a radio drive and we're going to offer it to people. And if you want to sell any tickets, like we take the money, but if you want to fill any rooms, like, and I was like, yeah, yes. And I said, I'll give you a thousand tickets. And the next day or so, she has me do this hour transformational talk on the on live on, and it went really well. They did their pledge drive and they sold all thousand tickets. They might've re-aired it a couple of times, but it was like, they sold them all. So now I only have 400 tickets to sell. So I gave them a few more. Now it's like a couple hundred, something like that. 
And that was easy to sell because I'm literally telling everyone, we're in this new huge theater. You got to see it. Boom, sold out event. At that event, God, there's so many stories. At that event, the goal my team and I had at that event that I ended up transcending that was we had this goal of what if we offer these packages where they can work with me for a week in groups of eight, and then we'll spend a year doing like a week with eight people and then take a week off and then another eight, and it'll be like $10,000 or whatever it was. And we got excited about, you know, the people in the 1400 seat audience buying something at the end where they could do a, you know, a more intimate thing with me where they could work with me for a week or whatever. And that the plan was going to be, we would bring in a ton of money and do these retreats for a year. But I'm on stage doing this event and I'm hearing my content. And at one point that sounded really heavy to me. So I walk off stage and I get done with the event and I'm like, I was going to go out there and meet everybody and sign them up to come do the event. And instead I walk off stage and I tell the team, I don't want to go out there. And I, I don't want to go meet them. And I don't, and, and I, I know, I knew I was sitting on probably a million dollars if I went out there, like I, I could see that would, but I also don't want to go work, do retreats for a freaking year. Right. And I felt myself go, it's not a 10 in my heart to do a retreat for a year. And so the, the team goes, okay, we'll go try and sell them. And I'm like, okay, but I kind of was a little bit hoping it didn't work and it didn't. One of my teammates goes out and there's this rush of people that are asking where I am. And then she just got freaked out and ran away. <laughs> and I remember going to the back room and seeing her sitting on the floor and she goes, we didn't sell any. And this was the first thing I said, do you realize how big we're about to be? And she goes, did you hear me? We didn't sell any. And I go, I know something bigger is trying to happen. And I just knew that's what was trying to, I just heard my content that was delivered through me the whole weekend. Something bigger is trying to happen than us just doing this at the level of making a ton of money and working our ass off. So, mm -hmm. so then all of a sudden we weren't stuck going to Big Bear and doing retreats. So I was just off the next week and I realized we filmed the event and I was like, to one of my teammates, I was like, come out and why don't you make a trailer with me of our events? So we made this beautiful trailer of our live events and you see this enormous theater. And then we rented the theater again for a few months down the line. And that trailer did really well. This was kind of this new cutting edge trailer got, I don't know, like a million views. And we sold that freaking event out. And then we we're like, let's make more videos. And we made, we, one day we're at dinner and someone on my team says to me, what do you think ghosts are? And I jokingly said, I think ghosts are people that aren't letting go of their old house or their old, and they're, if they would just learn to let go. And someone said, you should coach ghosts. So we made a sketch, Life Coaching for Ghosts, and it came out on Halloween. Then we made a Thanksgiving sketch where we did the sketch that I don't know if you've ever seen, but it was how enlightened families argue. And it was just a family all talking to each other, but from like these Byron, Katie, you know, this family's crazy, but the real problem is my resistance to this family's crazy. And we're all saying these things that got 11 million views. And all of a sudden my Facebook skyrockets, I'm offered a book deal that becomes a New York times bestseller. Had I chased the money in the short term, I wouldn't have built this foundation. So this created this just, this was what the big teaching. And that was for me. Every second you have a calling that's trying to show up. It's a very open-ended calling. That's the calling that says, what if we left this company? What if we asked that person out? What if we go to Italy right now? What if we wrote a book? It's this kind of new portal to a new world. And when it shows up, it's always met with the ego freaking out, coming up with why you shouldn't. So the first thing is this calling that's like your opportunity. And it's met with a counterbalance of fear, a yeah, but. Yeah, but if that happens, right? If you listen to the opportunity, the fear dies. If you listen to the fear, the opportunity dies. And every second you're here to follow, in my eyes, that higher thing. So when we were seven sold out Alex Theater events in, we did seven theaters, seven times the Alex Theater, sold out events, made video products that are all on our membership site. Amazing stuff. There's the last one we're about to do. I had this calling in me that goes, what if we did the Dolby Theater? That's a 3,400 seat theater. That's where the Oscars are, right? And I was like, I know how to follow this thing now. So I was like, go call them. So we, we call them and turns out the Dolby Theater wants this 
crazy six figure number to do a two day event. They're all like, you have to use their union people. It's a lot of money. And it was way beyond our budget and what we're used to, but I wanted to do it. And that's the only thing that mattered, the yes. So I said, here's, here's, here's a lot. Here's, here's the, here's the whole thing. And I went from a guy that wants to do the Dolby theater to a guy that does the Dolby theater. And that weekend, I still had one last Alex theater event left. And when I walked on that stage, I was so in the pocket that I started just riffing about that. We got the telling the story kind of like this, that we got the Dolby theater. And while I'm doing it, a dude in the back of the room gets up and runs to the back and then someone else does and someone else does. And I was like, where's everyone going? And like, it was almost like God put this person in there. Someone from the back of the room yells, they all want to be the first to buy tickets to the Dolby theater. Now we didn't have anyone in the back selling, right? But when that person said it, the whole audience gets up and runs to the mm -hmm. back of the room. There were probably mm -hmm. in that moment, 1,250 people in the room because some people were in the lobby or whatever, 1,250. Mm -hmm. We sold 1,700 tickets. So I immediately mm -hmm. got the money back for the theater two days later. And wow. now I, I had, you know, this other opening for another, whatever, another 1,700 tickets to sell, which was easy. Mm -hmm. And and that moment was so crazy because to 1,250 people, we sold 1,700 tickets with zero planning on a pitch, zero, you know, there was no pitch. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was no one there to sell. I just went to the back of the room and my team ran after matching the audience and then sold them the tickets. And I'm in the back of the room watching sales come in. And I just saw that as the match to the leap. And so that's kind of how the third world works in my opinion. When you follow the higher frequency, you you know you're only stressed because your your mind can measure what you lose. You can't see what you'll gain, but at the same time, it's almost giving you permission to a new portal, and it wants to flush out the old life you were living. And if you don't honor the old life, yeah, but and it's a paradigm busting thing, you move into higher frequency. So it's just heaven. So that's how that's how the third level works, and um, you know. Uh, I spent the last 10 years doing that, whatever it is, 11 years. And the ironic thing is now where I'm at is in a place of a lot of introversion. I actually think evolving out loud is capped at me evolving out loud and telling everyone about it in that mm -hmm. I'm getting their approval for my revelations. And I hear God telling me or a higher me telling me, these revelations are for you now. I want you to stop having mom be proud of you via your audience about what you're realizing. And you need to have an insight and have it. The amount of times that I've had an insight and want to tweet it and the insight will be like, dude, this is for you, not for you to just re reiterate it to someone else. You'll just create a world where they're all reiterating it to someone else and no one's actually living the freaking principle. It's going, I want you to live the point I'm making versus just share it. And I'm not saying I can't share things sometimes, but I really noticed that the Absolutely Everything Pass, our membership site that I'm so proud of, needs to be much more now just me answering their questions. Because in the oneness world, I notice those speakers don't tell much of their stories. They're, mm. they're revelations. You know what I mean? The Rupert Spira's, Eckhart Tolle's, Muji's are just kind of in this oneness answering questions. And I hear the universe telling me, you got to stop getting love for your insights because I'm the love for your insights. So I'm losing my attachment through my moves to the external um, in order to ascend. Otherwise, I'm stuck at, does everybody see how great I am, right? And, and give me approval for this. Mm. So it's, it's going, I really need to do this inner work with you alone now. And so there is a letting go happening and still I'll do my work, but it's a different frequency now. So I'm not that, that the out loudness is for me to go internal now. Beautiful. Well, you've left behind a couple of really amazing books. I'm sure these are not the last books you're going to write. Um, but even though the books on the surface appear to be about things like money or, you know, I hope I screw this up. Really, I think the central message in both and in this conversation and in the evolving out loud events is just living with more alignment. Let's say someone just, if 
found out about you through this conversation and, and it resonates. What's right. like a next step? I know you meditate, I meditate, and you know, we follow the inner guidance, but what's the next step for somebody who's literally just found out about this 90 minutes ago? Well, here's a really, <laughs> a really weird sounding one, but we're in a time consciously where as long as you stay alive, you're ascending. Mm. Meaning like right now, <laughs> life, life is making it impossible for you to not ascend. Life is taking us from our addictive patterns, from each other, from attachment, from all of these things, because it's trying to get you to meet yourself. And under your constant, do I have enough friends? Do I have a relationship? Under that is a, an inner child that needs you to spend some time with it. And what you can know is that we're all doing that right now. Like, I really believe the collective is massively awakening to reality was not what they thought. We're discovering this kind of matrix. We're learning the, the way life was. It's not just go achieve something and retire. It's not you are what you do. And life is working really hard to help you remove the patterns in your body. Mm. You know, it's it's trying to... You know, we had the old paradigm of think positive. Well, just so you know, there's darkness in the body that's just unseenness that just needs to be seen. And for us to move forward, life is opening us up and it's making it impossible to see what our next steps are, which is fine. And it's going to remove what doesn't align with you. What what was a part of you, but no longer, I actually feel like the universe is collectively purging our traumas, our ancestral history, our, our old stories, our limitations, and it's creating room for holy crap synchronicities and moving us from the third to a fifth dimension. And it's a gift and we just have to stay alive because you'll just have days where you want to cry and that's you purging an old identity. And, and you're, as long as you're alive, you're growing. So don't ever think that you're there, mm. like that you're done. You're always growing. And when you have that moment of, I thought we were through this already. Well, it's got more. And life, <laughs> life is just melting the ice that you thought you were to move you into the true water that flows that you are. And you're just love. And everything that's not love is being seen with a big light right now and dissolved into the oneness that you are. So it's an amazing time if you understand what's going on. My listeners uh, have heard me mention the shine um, events that I used to throw in in, uh, in Los Angeles and, and New York and places. But you were talking about how your your ex-partner, you, you and she met at the shine. So t what happened exactly? Did she come up to you or she DM'd you later? Or what was She's, the, she what was saw the me first at shine. Um, mm -hmm. and then later I was on Facebook and she liked a picture of mine and I just saw her and I was like, how about Friday? And, and, <laughs> and we went out and the, the, the biggest point of that, I guess I would say is that this girl in all these pictures is a mm -hmm. byproduct of Christy and I hanging out successfully <laughs> that I have this amazing five-year-old daughter named Vivi. So yeah, mm -hmm. had you not had shine, I don't know if Vivi would exist, which is <laughs> mind blowing because she's so wonderful, man. And it's just so such a fulfilling thing for me to have this kind of mm -hmm. shift and grounded thing. And then I almost feel like the pandemic in my area helped because it put me in a position to have to stay home and like really become present and become a better listener to the now and not always be on tour and not trying to be getting to the next gig and not just being how big can this get and just being a dad. And uh, I love being a dad. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's a really amazing experience and mm. it, it can take away some of your egoic happiness because you have this other energy here but it it brings fulfillment and purpose and reason and you know it's a it's this it's an amazing experience i know that everyone knows what it's like to hear a person talking about having a kid and it's a long story and it's a big thing for them but like it's really it's really crazy how much is opened in my heart from being a dad i want to I want to talk about that, but your your description, it just kind of took me back to my childhood. And I was trying to remember, what is my earliest memory 
of my dad, right? And I remember my dad, I just, he worked a lot. He would come home, he would um, watch the news. He would uh, sit on the toilet and read Newsweek magazine in the evening. And, uh, and then he would drink a beer and then he would go to bed and he would leave really early and he would leave again and he would work. So my impression was like, he was a hard worker who liked the news a lot. Mm. What do you think, what do you think, Viv, what do you think her earliest memory of you would be? And through that lens, oh. it's like a five-year-old, some guy who meditates, who just sits on the couch with his eyes closed for two hours. No, <laughs> that's such a good question. Boy, that's such a good question. What would Vivi's first memory of me be? Well, I mean, there's a, first of all, there's a lot of joy. We bond over music and we're funny together and play a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I know that as she was forming memory, I was also showing her things, whether it be visually seeing something, hearing a song or a movie or a character or whatever. Um, that's such, a, I've never thought of that. What is her, I'm really curious what it is. In fact, I might ask her later today. Like, what is it? <laughs> and, you know, you well, always try to make sure it's a good thing. Like, I hope she's not like, yeah. oh, you were drunk, you know, <laughs> or something, but I don't think so. You know, let's you talk about angry. your early, mm -hmm. you, go ahead. Your earliest memory. You, you mentioned your mom in your book, but you didn't talk much about your dad. So, can you share a little bit about your earlier memories and, and, and what you remember? kind of growing mm -hmm. up and whatever well, it's uh, takeaways you had from your parents, example? One thing that I've been playing with that's really interesting is our dreams that we have as a, as a child aren't always mm -hmm. just your, your, your dharma or your calling. Sometimes our dreams are mm -hmm. out of an escape from trauma, right? So mm -hmm. to give you an example, the most present and connected I ever felt to my dad was when we were watching stand-up comedy. His uncle was the prop man for a comedian named Gallagher. His mom was a puppeteer for different celebrities, the Carol Burnett show. She was on the Carol Burnett show. And when we watched stand-up comedy, um, I would feel like he was here, you know, and hmm. I would feel like I had him and I had his attention. I had his approval. And I became a stand-up comic as a child, but uh, Your so dad, for, for me, for me, yeah. my, my dad, um, I felt connected with him and bonded with him when we watched stand-up comedy. And so as a child, like in second grade, I started doing Gallagher's material for second graders, which, which was weird because I was talking about sex and taxes with a Southern accent and I didn't know what I was talking about. But like every year I would kind of negotiate with the teachers if I could do stand up and I would, you know, as a kid do Gallagher material or Stephen Wright or whatever. And then I was doing talent shows and everything and everything was dad, did you see that? Or mom, did you see that? And creating a worth based on the stage. And this unconsciously can create a drive that we think is while wow, we're really driven, but we're actually also driven out of survival. Like mm -hmm. these are my parents. So they're the people that feed me and house me. They better see me and acknowledge me. So I'm going to do the thing they seem to be the most focused on. And so I've been playing with the last few years, even though I had a massively great, successful, joyous, you know, first half of my life as a stand up comic from 12 to like mid 30s, whatever it was. There's a me also going how much of that was to not get hurt or to not have a lack of approval or not be shamed or whatever. And so I've been playing with a lot of our big fantasy lives that we have when we're kids are out of pain. Like when you see like Orphan Annie going like, someday I'll be free. Like these are our fantasies coming up that we're coming up with out of the trauma in our bodies. And so, and one of the things that I've been really interested in is the fact that you can outgrow your dream. You can, you can literally, I experienced my dream career and at one point it ran its course. And so there was a higher me coming through going, you're something else. And this is so big because there's so many people going, what's my purpose and what's my, what's the reason for being here. And you're so much bigger than being able to narrow your purpose down to one thing. You're a constant unfolding of so many things. So 
my bond with my dad, the, the memories I have that are really joyous with my dad are uh, stand-up comedy, are seeing stand-up or watching sitcoms, um, different things like that. Um, so that's the main memory I have of him. And then, you know, with my mom, um, it's really interesting. I feel like for a certain part of my life, she was so proud of my musical abilities, my being funny and stuff. And then I also have a memory of her being cynical when I went into comedy, like, we'll see if it becomes something we'll see, you know, I'd, I'd get on like a late night show and be like, I'm doing the show. And she'll be like, well, what's it pay? You know? And, and there was a me going, see me, please see me. And it's weird because when I was really young, I felt like I was really seen for my talent and stuff and loved for it. And then it almost was like, there's this different person kind of had this hesitancy about it, which I really felt um, was a great combination because there's this carrot on the end of the stick that I have to get her back to that person that's proud of me for the comedy and for the entertainment. And uh, so, yeah, my childhood was primarily in Seattle and I have, you know, lots of good memories and, and some bad and just lots of, lots of inner work that I'm doing every day on it, you know? Were you, Still. were you a natural at comedi comedian? Uh, were you a natural, funny, naturally funny comic? Or did you have like a Rocky montage of working really hard behind the scenes to appear natural in your thousands of, of sets from yeah. the age of 12 on? <laughs> I think, I think comedy was, because I saw Stan, like my favorite shows as a child were Evening mm -hmm. at the Improv on a and &E. I wasn't watching cartoons. All the other <laughs> kids were watching He-Man and stuff. And I literally was watching stand-up comedy. I couldn't wait to watch on like Thursday nights, I think it was, Evening at the Improv. You'd see all these young, you know, Seinfeld, young, all these, all these, I remember every one of them. And um, so comedy was in the blood it was you know and then another thing is i also have a very musical background i have a musical family i have an uncle on my mom's side who's a uh grammy nominated jazz musician who's incredible so happy mm -hmm. birthday in our family was in three four part harmony often and you know my favorite sounds were the beach boys i love harmony i love hearing different voices and everything um in fact i i hear the harmony almost more than the melody in songs and the reason I bring that up is because I think that created a natural timing in stand-up comedy. I can hear the beats of the pauses and I, in the combination of music and hearing it and then watching comics so much and seeing their pauses while I'm developing as a human being made it very natural for me. I'll tell you the real revelation I'm having is that, and I've, I've been playing with for the last 10 years, is I really learned how to be a comedian before I knew how to be a person. And in other words, I was on stage at 12 and working and then, you know, making money at 15 and, and doing clubs. And I had this thing that got attention and got love. I mean, I was bullied as a kid and then would do stand up, and I wasn't, you know, like I remember being bullied. I was a chubby kid in school and, and being pantsed and, and yelled at and, and stuff. And when I got funny, everything changed. It was like protection across mm -hmm. the board. And so this comedian with all these hidden wounds started going on stage. But when you go on stage and you're, you're killing at clubs and you're doing 300 people shows a night and you're getting all this love afterwards, that is a nice numbing of the pain that's under it. And all these things unfolded for me in my twenties and thirties that caused me to have to go inward and look at the wounds inside and it was like the biggest gift because I'm, I feel like I'm letting go of the idea that who I am is a speaker or a comedian or a musician. They're clothes that I wear, but I'm still in the constant, ongoing, expansive, everyday changing search of what I truly am. I just continually find it more by identifying everything I'm not. Right. So I'll have these moments where I'm like, well, I'm not a comedian because I'm able to still do other things. And that's a thing I can do, but it's just tools. And we get caught in, I am a dad. No, it's a tool. I am the now. 
right? It's a, it's a, I, I, if I'm the now first, then I can bring that into dad. If I'm the now first, I can bring that into comedy. Yeah. But when we get identified as this is what I am, you're setting yourself up for a lot of pain because if that goes away, then you're screwed, right? If I am a stand up comic and then I get an anxiety like I did, I, I get an anxiety as a stand up comic that undoes what I am. So is there even a purpose in living? And when you start to get, that's not what you are. That's just a career you have. And most people define, I am my cars in the garage or how much money I have or how much debt I have or my victim story or my achievement story. And mm -hmm. that that's what limits you. And all those things can change. So it's such a lie to say, I am that, right? It seems like also, you know, being a comedian at such a young age, it makes you more observant as a child and makes you question convention more as a young person. Totally. Including, you know, religion, what is school really all about? Am I ever going to use, you know, trigonometry in day-to-day -day life? And, you know, what kind of bits can I create around all of that? So what was your relationship like with the things that all the other kids were into? Maybe church, maybe school, maybe girls. Were you a normal, we considered a normal child? growing up you know what you consider weird? yourself to be an outcast yes As i i it's weird because i had this combination of liking a ton of things that no one else my age liked but being oblivious to that it was weird to them like i mean almost like for instance like in high school all the grunge and junior high grunge was happening like and i lived in seattle mm -hmm. right so so everyone around me is into to nirvana and pearl jam and stuff <laughs> and I'm obliviously obsessed with Hall and & Oates and, and Huey Lewis. <laughs> and I had no idea that I didn't have any sense of style. I'd wear puffy Mervyn's coats and, you know, and I'd, I'd, I'd be, you know, in drama class and playing trombone. But I just was so loud about it. Like I had a horn, an air horn in my car that played tequila. <clears throat> and it also did it on a rotation. So it also start the repeat. So it sounded really bad. So I'd be like, da, 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 da. <laughs> right? and I'd, I'd pull into the school and play that thing. Like everyone's thrilled. This bizarre guy is here. And I, and I, I think my absolute undeniable oblivion to what a dork I was made it almost okay. And uh, so I was an outcast, but thinking I wasn't <laughs> like I was, I was an outcast, but thinking everyone's loving what I'm about. And uh, you know, and then really looking back on it, I just see this guy that, you know, I did, I did stand up at the schools and I had these things and I was this bizarre combination of, unbelievably dorky and mildly popular. Um, but uh, yeah, so I didn't have many of the same interests. I had one dear best friend, my friend Justin, and he and I just wrote all kinds of stuff and cry laughed and just bonded. And he's still like my closest friend ever. Although my teammate Mary is also very close mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. But like, just like, you know, had this bond with a couple of people. I've been both extroverted and introverted. And by that, I mean, like, I, di I didn't like being with large groups of people unless I was on stage, which is, which is actually kind of introverted. And, but I also liked having one person, you know, like mm -hmm. having one person I can bond with. So I, I don't like just wild giant places of people that I'm just lost in, but I, you know, like I, there's one person is great, you know. And you had more money than any of your friends back then because you had been doing all those corporate gigs from your your chamber of commerce experience, right? That well, the chamber. So the there were a few things. There was, I remember, <clears throat> one thing that I, I don't know if this is something I got from my dad, but my dad was an unbelievably creative uh, entrepreneur. And I watched mm -hmm. my dad form companies out of thin air in an always non-conventional way. I think that's part of, like, when I think about it, our family is this very unique group of people that mm -hmm. like my dad's just doing these things. There's no way to do it. That It's just his way and it works. And I remember being a kid and my dad giving me 
a bunch of business cards that said certified babysitter and lawn care and all this stuff. And whenever neighbors would come in, I'd hand it to them. Whenever I was whatever age you got to be to to do that. So I, whenever I, I'd go to all the neighbors' house and I'd hand them these cards and I would work every night doing, you know, babysitting or whatever else. That shifted into the same oblivion that was a good oblivion that there's a way already to do something because I just went right through the world's ways of doing things and did my own unique way. So what you're asking about the the corporate parties is a really good example. I one time was in a club and I asked a comedian, I said, how do comics make really good money? And he said, well, there's corporate parties. Companies have a party or whatever. I remember him also saying, you're probably too young for that. I didn't even hear that part. I was just like, how do I do corporate parties? And I asked my mom, I said, where do corporations meet up? And she told me there's the ch- there's this thing called the Chamber of Commerce, which is like all these heads of businesses meet up. And in Redmond, that was like Microsoft, Sears, Nintendo, like all like in Redmond, Washington, many of the companies in the Chamber of Commerce were parts of enormous corporations. And so I called the Chamber of Commerce and I asked them, can I get the mailing labels for the businesses there. And they said, it's 50 bucks. And I remember my mom being like, why are you spending 50 bucks? And I was like, I'm going to go give them. I drove over with 50 cash. And I was like, can I get the labels? And they gave me, I don't remember, 500, 700 labels. And I made a very basic, are you having a corporate party looking for entertainment? Call Kyle Cease. And I, and I mailed it to all of them and paid, you know, the stamp for whatever it was, 500. And my mom's like, why are you spending this money or whatever? And Next thing I know, I'm doing corporates at 15 for Sears, Nintendo. I brought a keyboard. I, I did impressions a lot at that time. I had a card. I had a business card also that said comedian impressionist. And then the, the thing said under it, <laughs> it said, finally, a good Julia Child impression at an affordable price. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I think that's what, that's what everyone's looking for. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like my usual Julia Child impressions are too much. So is there a price I can? And I, it was funny because I would, I would do the stuff and, and make agreements with these businesses and, and I would go and do the gigs. And here's this 15 year old being driven to their gig in, mm-hmm. in like a full suit holding a keyboard. And I would do like Lexus's corporate event or, you know, and that was just because my body was like, oh, how do I? And then I just did it. And I did. Mm-hmm. There was an oblivion that I'm realizing I had that was so amazing. <laughs> and 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 the oblivion was taking me from the world of you. It doesn't work that easy. You can't do that. All of those things that people say, like, you'd be too young to do that. Or if you want to get a movie, you need to do this and this and this first. Like, I booked 10 things I hate about you without an agent or audition experience or a headshot, you know? And it was because you could just create your own thing your way. And I really believe the universe is trying to give you all these unique ways of doing whatever you want. And there's no rules as long as you're not hurting anyone and it's expansive, you know? And so, um, we we go usually there's a a route to do everything that everyone else does and that's what kind of makes you cattle like if you want to get in the movie you're going to go through an agent and submit 9 million headshots to agents and then hope and do the process like at one point i was so oblivious i was booking work every day and doing you know i even i remember i remember getting Cracker Jack boxes and making a, a v- audio demo tape of me doing voiceover work and putting it in the Cracker Jack boxes and sending it to producers. Um, and, and they sent it out, you know, or I sent it out and they would open the Cracker Jack box and there'd be this demo tape that they'd put in the car and uh, they'd hear me and then I'd get work. I was suddenly doing like voiceover for kids, educational software and different things like that. And, you know, there was a company called Edmark that called me all the time. And it was weird because at the time, I don't remember the price, but I might've been making like somewhere between 150 and 200 an hour. But when you're 15, that's weird. And it's, and it's 94, you know, that was a crazy thing to be experiencing. So did you have, yeah. did you have any, any exposure to any sort of spiritual ideologies or philosophies back in those late teen no. days? 
Not really, but because of our kind of counterculture way of being, my family saw any of that as just a scam. Like, mm. you know, um, <laughs> like mainstream, mainstream uh, churches have an agenda, you know, uh, I remember there was a woman named Romtha. Do you know who that is? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah. I read all of her books. Yeah. She, so that the lady was in, you know, we, we lived in Washington at the time when she was really big. I think she still is, but mm-hmm. you know, that was just J, and, JK something or another. I can't remember. J, yeah. I can't remember her name either. I want to say Rowling, but that's Harry Potter lady. I know. But, but yeah. And like, so I remember them being like the Romtha is doing this thing. And there was this very, it was a bizarre combination of counterculture making fun of things through comedy meets mainstream media's belief system, you know? So we were very like, we didn't go to church there. If ever I asked my parents a religious thing, like what is God? Like you just kind of feel this, like, (laughs) I don't know. And then my dad wanting to look like he'll have a big talk, but he didn't really have a specific, (laughs) well, let's talk about, but there was not really, I don't know. It was, but not saying I don't know. It was just kind of like, it was not a thing yet. And then when I was in my early 20s as a comic, I always look at what I do now. And if you showed the kid, if you showed me at 23 as a stand up comic, that what I will be doing at 45 will be often shifting 60 year old women out of their traumas. You know, I mean, <laughs> my audience is all ages, but, you know, our absolutely everything passes primarily, you know, women. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, there's moments I've been at like a retreat center, like in Rhythmia or something, and I'm sitting with 10 people. And if you show this aspiring kid who was on his way to Comedy Central and everything, hey, just so you know, here's you in your, here's you in your 40s. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, I become everything I make fun of. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, because the me in my 20s would have been making fun of what me in my 40s is, mm-hmm. you know. Did you have a, do you have like an Obi-Wan Kenobi figure in your life at that time in your hero's journey? Kind of mentoring you or giving you insight That's a about great, life. Another weird oblivion that I had was I always connected to what I perceived as the highest frequency in the room, even as a child. So to give you an example, I was more bonded with, this is an embarrassing thing to say, but I was more bonded with the teachers than the students in in school. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it would almost be like me and my third grade teacher, Mr. Sissel sitting there and me being like, what are these kids going to be up to? Like, I'm I'm like acting (laughs) like him. Like I know what life's like and I'm seeing it through his perspective. But Here's where that really got cool, though, was in stand-up comedy, when I started doing the big clubs in Seattle, I really loved the headliners more than the people that were where that were the beginners where I was. Like I saw them as as people to bond with. And every amazing artist, I would always think that's available. That level of good is available. And so when I And so I became good really quickly because I wasn't really in the open mic circuit as much as I did a couple open mics, then was asked by those headliners to tour with them. And I was suddenly seeing only the best work. It's really powerful to see the very best and just continually be surrounded by that versus getting caught in a sea of people that are all new at it. And we're all in this cynicism of how hard it is and in that frequency, because I was a working comic really quickly and almost oblivious to that. It will take time and it's not that easy and everything and really moving up to the best me. And then when I booked 10 things, I hate about you, I lived in Seattle. And when it came out, I moved to LA and I remember seeing the best comics there. And I would be in the lineup at night at the laugh factory with, you know, Dane Cook and, and Howie Mandel and Rodney Dangerfield and Chris Rock. And I was there nightly. And I, I remember when the best would go on and sometimes some comics would reject that. Like I remember Dane Cook going up and some comics not liking it or something like that and leaving and kind of staying connected to each other in their hatred of the ones that were successful or something. But Mm -hmm. to me, I'm like, that's, that it, and it's the same pattern as me bonding with the teacher 
about the other students. It's like, who's the best I want to open to them? And, and I did. And, and it was, it was amazing because I saw those comics as permission, inspiration, and the level I wanted to be at. And so I toured and had really good sets because I saw a world where the hardest level of killing was possible. And so, and then that, and that transcended to after leaving the comedy world and feeling like that was done, seeing that in Wayne Dyer or Michael Beckwith, or just, you know, the heroes of spirituality and becoming friends with like Michael Beckwith and speaking at Agape and, and working with people that were <clears throat> the best that I could find. And now it's down to God. It really is. I'm noticing the, the, the teacher in the room now that I connect to is that higher self that's trying to get me to be more that higher self. Mm -hmm. And boy, is that, is that a revelation? Like, it's like, that's the highest there is. That's the highest and your awareness grows. So then the highest is you and, you know, you or, or God or the universe or whatever that, that, that's the one that I'm listening to the most now. Beautiful. Well, we'll put links to your online community. Um, and your books and your social media and all of that wonderful stuff, because you, you, your, your messaging, just the stuff you've already created is just, I think it's an asset. I, I quote you all the time on, on my socials and I'm just, I'm honored to be, to be able to call you a friend, man, and, and to have you on the show and to talk a little bit deeper about your story and to be able to just broadcast this to people who may or, or may not be familiar with your work because they absolutely need to be so thank you very much for coming on and oh, for being so you. open and, and transparent and uh and i look forward to seeing you at some point in person very soon if you like that video you're gonna love the next one click this thumbnail right here and i'll see you over there